Good evening, it's Monday 21st of October. Our top stories. Down to the wire, Moldova decides on whether to join the European Union against the backdrop of Russian interference. Israel carry out, carries out strikes on Beirut, saying it's targeting Hezbollah's financial infrastructure. Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe removed from a royal reception after shouting at King Charles. And legal questions over Elon Musk's million-dollar handouts ahead of the U.S. presidential election. You're watching The World. I'm Giris Saulani. Good to have your company. Also tonight, Bangladesh issues an arrest warrant for former leader Sheikh Hasina. But will India give her up? With fewer than 1.5% of the votes to be counted, provisional results suggest Moldova has voted by the slimmest of margins to join the European Union. 50.31% voted in favour of EU membership after warnings from authorities of Russian interference in the referendum. Polling before the vote had suggested the referendum would pass comfortably with about 60% of the country's voters in favour of the move. We have clear evidence that these criminal groups aim to buy 300,000 votes, a fraud of unprecedented scale. Their objective was to undermine a democratic process. Their intention was to spread fear and panic in society. We will not back down from defending democracy and freedom. We are waiting for the final results and we will respond with decisions. The former Soviet state applied for EU membership after Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022. At the same time, Moldovans have also voted in the presidential campaign, with the pro-EU incumbent Maya Sandu receiving the most votes, but not enough to avoid a runoff election on November the 3rd. And we'll have more analysis on this a little later in the program. Israel has carried out multiple strikes on Lebanon's capital after announcing it would target Hezbollah's financial in institutions. Shortly after the warning, explosions rocked Beirut. The Israeli Air Force hit at least 10 sites across the city, as well as targets in the Beka Valley in the east and near the border in the south. Meanwhile, in Gaza, hopes of a ceasefire are dwindling after an Israeli strike left 87 people dead or missing. Middle East correspondent Matthew Doran begins tonight's report with the events in Lebanon. It's a noor. It's a noor bath. Explosions at the edge of Beirut's international airport. Lighting a night sky, blanketed in smoke. We will be attacking a large number of targets in the next few hours and more targets later tonight. The target, Al Qad Al Hassan, a sanctioned non profit the US says the Hezbollah militant group uses to manage its money. Also used by civilians, it has more than a dozen branches in the densely populated capital. It's a second straight day of strikes inside Beirut. Here, the IDF hitting what it says was a Hezbollah intelligence centre and weapons facility, killing three of the group's commanders. The US Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin says Washington wants Israel to scale back its strikes on its northern neighbour, particularly in and around Beirut, adding that the number of civilian casualties is simply far too high. These latest strikes suggest that plea from Israel's strongest ally have gone unheard. All the while in Gaza, Israel's offensive in the north continues. The streets of Beit Lahia coated in ghostly grey. The dust of buildings, once homes, now piles of rubble. We were asleep around midnight when it suddenly felt like an earthquake hit the area. Dozens killed by an Israeli strike in the northern Gaza city. All those who were martyred here are children, women and displaced people who fled from other areas due to heavy strikes, seeking shelter in what they believed to be a safer place. Children cowering in hospitals after what they've endured. The Israeli military accused Hamas of exaggerating the death toll and insisted the strike used precise munitions against a Hamas target. The killing of the group's leader, Yahya Sinwar, doing little to slow the relentless barrage in Gaza. Matthew Doran, ABC News, Jerusalem. At least one person has died in severe flooding in northern Italy. More than 300 rescues took place and people have been warned to stay indoors due to flooded roads and landslides. 
multiple rivers have, have overflowed in Emilia Romania region after heavy rains over the weekend. Schools and parks have been closed with a large cleanup underway. A parliamentary reception for King Charles and Queen Camilla in Canberra was shaken by protests today with Victorian Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe hurling insults and accusations at the monarch before being escorted out. It disrupted an otherwise carefully coordinated day in the nation's capital where thousands of well-wishers gathered for a chance to meet the royal couple. Stephanie Delzell reports. They died for king and country. And now, the King honouring them. King Charles and Queen Camilla at the War Memorial in Canberra, starting a day of royal engagements in the capital. Outside, more than 4,000 people waited hours for a glimpse of the pair. Many enamoured. God save the king. Some, like nine-year-old alpaca Hefner, <laughs> less so. He's met a few famous people over his time. On the forecourt of Parliament House, a more enthusiastic greeting. 21 shots, salutes hands. Oh. and handshakes, with crowds camping out to be part of history. <laughs> Prime Ministers past and present were inside the People's House for a parliamentary reception. As tributes were paid... You have stood with us proudly in good times. ..and gratefully received. In my many visits to Australia, I have witnessed the courage and hope that have guided the nation's long and sometimes difficult journey towards reconciliation. The extent of that highlighted just moments later. Our bones, our skulls, our Independent our Senator Lydia Thorpe escorted out of the Great Hall. MPs later condemned the interruption, which didn't mar the sense of occasion for those who'd gathered. Is a head of state, no matter what people say. I thanked her for coming all this way. I gave her a tea towel. King Charles is only the second reigning monarch and the first ever king to visit Parliament House, following in the footsteps of his late mother, Queen Elizabeth, who opened this very building in 1988. <laughs> King Charles then held private one-on-one -on -one sessions with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and opposition leader Peter Dutton, before heading to the CSIRO and observing a simulated bushfire, the real version of which have dominated Australian summers. The climate-conscious king seeking to advance the environmental cause across his 16 visits to Australia. Laying down more roots, for future generations. If the summer doesn't get too hot. Stephanie Dalzell, ABC News, Canberra. The man accused by Turkey's government of launching a failed 2016 coup has died at the age of 83. Muslim preacher Fatullah Gulen had been receiving treatment in a U.S. hospital, according to a website that publishes his sermons. Mr. Gulen had been an early ally of Turkey's leader Recep Tayyip Erdogan, but lived in self-imposed exile in the U.S. for the last 25 years. Mr. Erdogan held Mr. Gulen responsible for the attempted coup in 2016. I have never supported a coup or an ouster. I think any change should happen as the result of an election, if that is required. It is important that democracy is not harmed. With just over two weeks to go until the US presidential election, Elon Musk has started a multi-million dollar giveaway to people who sign or share a petition he has started. But some, including the governor of the swing state of Pennsylvania, have raised questions about whether it's legal. <laughs> yeah. A life-changing giveaway or a criminal act. Elon Musk has jumped into the final weeks of the US election effort, starting a political campaign group with a petition backing free speech and gun rights. The businessman has been giving away a daily prize of one million US dollars to people who sign his petition. But those who sign also have to be registered voters in one of seven so-called swing states that may decide the U.S. election. Definitely hound friends, family, acquaintances, people on the street, everyone you meet, uh, to say, to just, just to register. It, we've got to register. 
I think it's something that law enforcement could take a look at. I'm not okay. the attorney general anymore of Pennsylvania, I'm the governor, uh, but it does raise some serious questions. People who are found to have induced others to register to vote with cash or lottery chances could face up to five years prison under US law. Mr Musk says people who have signed the petition do not have to vote. You just have to sign a petition saying you believe in the Constitution, which if you already believe in the Constitution, you're just signing something you already believe and you can win a million dollars. That's awesome. Your wealth and responsibility you are using to save speech and we just all appreciate it. We really do. So thank you so much. I do. Bye. Mr. Musk hasn't been alone in trying to get out the vote in Pennsylvania in new and unusual ways. State officials using Thai hippo Mu Deng to spruik postal votes. And Donald Trump has made a campaign stop at a McDonald's, claiming he had always wanted to work there, while casting doubt on Kamala Harris's stories of serving burgers as a student. Now I have worked at McDonald's. I've now worked for 15 minutes more than Kamala. OK, she, she never worked here. Meanwhile, the Democrats were working to court communities of faith, speaking to congregations in the swing states of Georgia and Michigan. It's wonderful. I, live, I feel blessed. I feel blessed. This parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, teaches us to love thy neighbour as thyself. Last month, the Pew Research Centre found Catholic and Protestant voters favour Donald Trump and he's been closing the gap in an average of national polls, with numbers the Harris campaign may not have been loving. Lachlan Patrick, ABC News. Israel's military says it is targeting Hezbollah's financial arm all over Lebanon. They've warned residents to stay away from areas they've described as sites used to finance Hezbollah's terrorist activity. Israel also continues to pound Gaza, striking homes in the north. Middle East correspondent Matt Doran is in Jerusalem and he joins me now. Matt, Israel's strategy in targeting Hezbollah's coffers, how will it impact the group's capabilities both politically and from an arms perspective? Well, we're still seeing the fallout from those strikes which occurred overnight and into the early hours of this morning, specifically in Beirut. But Israel says that the al Qur al Hassan bank is being used by Hezbollah to store its funds, to buy weapons, and then also to, uh, to pay some of its militants. And that is why it has decided to make these strikes. But uh, these strikes were quite extensive. Local media are saying that there were around 16 strikes across Beirut overnight and the problem is that these bank branches are in some incredibly densely populated areas and some locals also have business with these banks so uh, this is a, a deep concern for authorities because they are uh, looking at a situation where uh, people are getting caught up in these attacks civilians are being caught up in these attacks although Israel says it gave them plenty of notice to evacuate these areas saying last night in posts on social media to leave immediately or risk being caught up in some of these attacks there. This is a very dangerous play, though, by Israel because of just how densely populated Beirut is and the proximity to these banks of individuals being, or civilians rather, getting caught up in these attacks. It is not going to be uh, winning Israel much support around the world. And indeed, we have heard from the US Secretary of, of Defence, Lloyd Austin, saying that uh, Israel needs to to scale back its operations, its strikes in Beirut with that civilian toll far too high. And Matt, how has Hezbollah responded? We haven't heard much from Hezbollah at this stage in terms of words, but we have seen further actions from the militant group firing more rockets into northern Israel. As of this morning, uh, around 25 or so rockets had been fired into uh, northern Israel, and that is uh, something that Hezbollah uh, has been using as its response to ongoing Israeli aggression in its territory. This is something that follows on from uh, similar behaviour over the weekend. Uh, yesterday, more than 150 rockets were fired into northern Israel by Hezbollah, uh, the Iron Dome working overtime to shoot those missiles out of the sky and uh, protect the Israeli population from those threats.
And I want to turn our attention to the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and there have been more strikes targeting Hamas in the north. What can you tell us about these latest Israeli bombings in that area? Israel has been conducting a campaign in northern Gaza for some three weeks now and a lot of the focus has been on the area around Jabalia which is home to one of the largest refugee camps in Gaza. Uh, yesterday we saw some of that attention shift slightly further north to the area around Beit Lahia and uh, Israel is saying it was targeting Hamas militants there but local health authorities say that at least 87 people, 87 people were either killed or are missing as a result of those strikes. Figures that the IDF have been disputing, saying they'll launch their own investigation uh, and insisting that they were using precise munitions in their targeting of Hamas. But the pictures coming out of Gaza, or even if, even if uh, those munitions were precise, show the complete devastation of these neighbourhoods in Beit Lahia. Buildings which were once home that's, that have been razed to the ground and there are still serious fears uh, that some bodies are remaining under the rubble. The already stretched health system in the north of Gaza uh, being asked to take on even more patients who have been injured as a result of these strikes. The United Nations has condemned the latest strikes, saying that they are horrifying, reiterating calls for an end to the hostilities, an end to the war in Gaza, which would include the release of Israeli hostages by Hamas. Uh, but this really goes to show that despite the killing of the Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar late last week by by the Israeli Defence Force uh, that or forces that uh, any suggestions that could be seen as an opportunity for Israel to change course to potentially start winding back some of its aggression in uh, Gaza. Uh, those sort of calls or those, those that sense of opportunity uh, has certainly not come to uh, come to pass. Yeah, that toll will keep rising though. Um, Matt, overnight there's been quite the development in the US with the apparent leaking of top secret documents tra tracking Israel's possible action against Iran. What do those documents tell us? Yeah, this is the sort of third element at play in this broader Middle East conflict that we're seeing. Aside from the ongoing war in Gaza, the conflict in Lebanon, uh, all eyes are on how Israel will retaliate to that barrage of more than 180 missiles fired by Iran earlier this month. And uh, the US has certainly been keeping a close eye on this and some intelligence documents that it had uh, brought together were leaked online on the social media platform Telegram. Now, now, uh, they show details of Israel's exercises, getting ready for some of those, uh, for, for that retaliatory attack. Uh, they have details of what sort of weaponry may indeed be used by Israel in an, a retaliatory strike. And uh, the markings on the documents suggest that these are top secret documents for the use by the US and its Five Eyes intelligence partners, among them, of course, Australia in that group. It is very embarrassing that these documents have been leaked, and that is why an investigation has been launched but some have also suggested that having this information out there could cause Israel to change course and to uh, adapt and to change how it strikes uh, Iran in the near future. We still don't have any details to when those strikes could occur but those discussions are still happening here in Israel. Okay we'll uh, leave it there. Matt Doran in Jerusalem thanks very much. A seven-storey building has collapsed outside of Nairobi after being deemed structurally unsound. This building was reduced to rubble on Sunday in the Kenyan capital after being evacuated three days before. One person was injured by falling debris with a search and rescue mission underway to check if anyone was trapped inside. Local media reports the building was built without government approval. Samoa is hosting perhaps the biggest event in its history. The Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting has begun in the capital Apia, bringing together three monarchs, dozens of leaders and more than 4,000 delegates. It's the first time a Pacific Island nation has ever hosted the event. And the government has poured enormous resources into trying to make it a success. Foreign Affairs reporter Stephen Jedgetts is there. The Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, or CHOGAM, is kicking off here in Apia, the capital of Samoa. It is a very, very big event for a relatively small city to host. Some 4,000 delegates are going to come to Samoa for CHOGAM, along with three monarchs and many leaders from the 56 member countries which make up the Commonwealth. 
All of that, unsurprisingly, is putting a strain on local resources. The government of Samoa has brought in a cruise ship because its hotels are full to overflowing with all the people in town. On top of that, all of the VIP squadrons and delegations means that extra security is called for. And Samoa has called upon 11 Pacific nations, including Australia and New Zealand, for help. They're sending some 200 plus additional police to Apia to help provide security. It's the first manifestation of the Pacific Policing Initiative unveiled at the Pacific Islands Forum to great fanfare earlier this year in Tonga. On top of that, Samoa is making every effort to bring this event out of the capital and into the villages. Every single one of the 56 member countries of the Commonwealth has been assigned a village, and that village is then decked out in that country's national colours and national flags. Delegates are then encouraged to go and visit. The idea is not just to boost global awareness of Samoa, with one eye perhaps to tourism, but also to try and give delegates visiting the country exactly an idea about exactly what Samoa's key priorities are on the ground. Unsurprisingly, near the top of that list are issues around climate change. Samoa, like many nations in the Pacific and in the Commonwealth, faces existential threats from climate change. Many Caribbean countries are also part of the Commonwealth and they feel the threat with the same keen anxiety. Many countries in the Commonwealth, not just island states, but also developing states, including dozens from Africa, remain frustrated by just how difficult it is to get their hands on climate finance, the money that they need to deal with the cascading impacts of climate change. Expect that issue to be near the top of the agenda as leaders start to trickle into Apia towards the back end of this week. Of course, it's not just about Samoa and it's not just about climate change. This is also a critical event for King Charles. This is the first time that he will be here in his position as head of the Commonwealth. And given his lifelong advocacy of climate change, expect him to also do what he can to put that issue front and centre. Now, none of this means that age-old debates about the Commonwealth will go away. Every time Chogham happens, there's a perennial debate about whether it's still relevant because it has its roots in the British Empire. But Commonwealth officials say that it still does have a place in modern architecture across the globe. They say that as a gathering of fellow democracies, they share common ground, and that trade between Commonwealth countries has actually been booming, something they credit to the similar systems that Commonwealth nations have. Have. All of this means that even if progress is slow, perhaps painstaking, there will be plenty to talk about here in Samoa. And the government and people of Samoa will just be hoping that everything carries off without a hitch. Pope Francis has canonized 14 new saints in a ceremony in the Vatican City. Religious officials from the Catholic Church came together to celebrate the new saints. Among them are a group of 11 men, known as the Martyrs of Damascus, who were murdered in Syria in 1860. Two nuns and a priest were also canonized in recognition of their service to the faith. Lawyers say Qantas is facing a compensation bill of hundreds of millions of dollars for illegally sacking workers in the middle of pay negotiations. 1,700 ground crew, including baggage handlers and cleaners, will receive various payouts after being let go during the pandemic. It was a day that these Qantas workers had been fighting for for four years compensation for being illegally sacked when the airline outsourced their roles as they were preparing to strike. I can put it behind me now and it can, it can pay bills that I didn't anticipate. I expected to be there till I retired and when this happened it was an absolute shock. 1,700 sack ground crew will now receive payouts for what they went through ranging from $30,000 to $100,000 each. Marriages have broken down as a result of this. People have lost houses. People uh, have, have had distress, have had mental illnesses. Workers will also be compensated for one year of lost work after the court found the airline would have legally outsourced their roles in 2021. This is the spirit of Australia. You dig in when it gets tough and you don't give up. And, uh, and here we are today having a massive victory. Altogether, the airline is facing a big bill. It'll probably end up somewhere um, between, say, $300 and $350 million in compensation. 
While this might sound like a lot, this lawyer says that the company still saved cash by outsourcing the roles. Well, I think what they've done was the right decision financially because it will have saved them money. The airline had set aside $70 million for this legal battle, but now it has to go away and figure out the final bill. It says it'll be working with the union through a mediation process and once again it's apologised to its sacked workers. The airline is also facing a fine which will be decided at a later date. Amelia Turzon, ABC News. Former Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina remains in hiding in India after a special tribunal in Dhaka issued an arrest warrant for her. The ousted leader is wanted for her alleged involvement in possible crimes against humanity that took place during mass anti-government protests earlier this year. More than a thousand people were killed, that's according to figures from the current interim government. The violence forced Ms Hasina to flee to India in early August. So how will this all play out? Professor Sridhar Dutt is from the Jindal School of International Affairs and she joins me now from Delhi. Professor Dutt, really good to have you with us. I suppose the big question everyone wants answered is, will India give up Sheikh Hasina? Thank you for having me. Um, a simple answer to that would be a no. But uh, we must try and understand that in any extradition request, uh, there is always a very uh, intricate technical process involved, the judicial process involved. Also, as you know, in any extradition treaty, there's a caveat about political uh, considerations. So if uh, the Indian government feels that this has not been done in good faith and there are you know, prejudices against her, even on grounds like that, it could be refused. But I do not see a situation where uh, the demand is, you know, request comes up and India giving into it right away. Uh, I think there's a very complicated, complex process involved. And before we get into the politics of it all, do we know her whereabouts? Where in India is she? Whatever little we know, nothing's been in the public domain, but she's in the Hindan air base. We haven't heard of any movement uh, post that. And do you think this is diplomatically awkward for India, for the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, given there is that extradition treaty, but then there is that uh, clause that, you know, uh, India can interpret this as a political issue and uh, not grant the extradition? How do you see this balancing act being played out, particularly by the Modi government? I think for the government, uh, they feel that they would want to, you know, extend support and loyalty to a government and a political leader, uh, Sheikh Hasina here, who has always been extremely supportive of um, with India. And also we must remember that there's a strong historical links with her family as well as the political party. So there is a question of differentials here and we've seen that earlier in some of our earlier cases with, uh, with uh, you know, Dalai Lama and Tibetan refugees. So similarly, while I think Indian government would want to, and I certainly I see a future where India and Bangladesh will work together, uh, I think the destiny is intertwined. But at this po point of time, I do not really envisage India acceding to this particular demand immediately. Uh, there would be other consideration here, but one does hope that while that is, of course, important to the uh, interim government, uh, you know, this request, and I think they've set a date of 18th November for a trial hearing or something like that. Um, so, but it's unlikely, and you know, we've seen uh, situations like this when we've also wanted extradition with many of our friendly partner countries. We've had faced many difficulties, and in this case, it's a sensitive issue, a sensitive political leader. So clearly, there are more complexities involved. But I think the governments on both sides would need to, you know, keep that aside and uh, examine uh, more common areas on which they need to work together. Because I do believe. Uh, if not just now, they will have to work together, in, you know, in the future ahead. Yeah, but do you not think that perhaps Bangladesh, and this is something being watched by other uh, of India's South Asian neighbours, would this be seen by the Bangladeshi public as uh, India undermining uh, the, uh, the ju judiciary in Bangladesh? I agree to what you're saying. And uh, right now, as you know, there is a very high, you know, kind of a rhetoric against India going on in Bangladesh and in some of the other countries too. But at the same time, I think we will not forget our historical legacy. We will also, you know, the present loyalties are important. So 
I think those needs to be, you know, factored in. I, I do agree to the point that f the fact that, you know, Bangladeshis themselves are going to be upset about that. The interim government certainly uh, would use that, uh, you know, as a factor as to why uh, the bilateral relation may not be business as usual on this particular point. But at the same time, I think for India, uh, they probably think that once there is an elected government, the situation may be different. This is really what India perceives this as a very interim or the temporary, uh, you know, cabinet that they're talking to. So I'm not terribly convinced that India would factor in those issues, what you mentioned, and rightly so. India would wait its option, weigh in its options, and kind of delay the process, I would feel, while the interim government may express their uh, displeasure. Uh, that is, you know, I think, but one would have to work with that. Yeah, but we haven't seen that from the current interim leader in Bangladesh, a very highly respected Nobel laureate, uh, Mohammed Yunus. How do you think he's going to address this issue? And I, and I do note that they have had words with Narendra Modi as well. It is a difficult issue for both the leaders, I think. Both uh, Professor Yunus, who's, as you mentioned, extremely respected, and I think even all of India respects it and, you know, puts it very highly. But at the same time, the issue right now would be something that I said, it's it's complicated. And while we do respect, uh, you know, Professor Yunus and the interim government, and we do feel that, you know, th they are best case forward at this point of time, but uh, the Hasina extradition case is not going to be... Uh, you know, it's, it's not an open and shut case. There are complications involved. And I think uh, pragmatism is the way forward for both the sides. And uh, let's not lose sight of that. I think we have to, as I said, the differentials in foreign policy always. We've seen that in the past. Uh, so this is not the first time that India is going to be exploring that area. And I would think that Bangladeshi government is also extremely pragmatic and practical, and they would know that while they they would, you know, expect India to respond to their request, but it's not something as easy as uh, said. It'll be really fascinating to see what happens in the weeks and months to come. Professor Sriradha Dutt, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. You're watching The World, the top stories we are following tonight. Early results show Moldova voting by the slimmest of margins to join the EU amid warnings of Russian interference. Israel carries out strikes on Beirut, saying it's targeting Hezbollah's financial infrastructure. And legal questions over Elon Musk's million-dollar handouts ahead of the U.S. presidential election. Let's return to Parliament, where independent Senator Lydia Thorpe was removed from a royal reception after hurling insults at the king. Speaking to the BBC after the incident, Ms Thorpe said King Charles needed to do more to address the impact of colonisation in Australia. How can he stand up there and say that he's the king of our country? He's stolen so much wealth from our people and from our land and he needs to give that back. And he needs to entertain a conversation for a peace treaty in this country. We can lead that, we can do that, we can be a better country, but we cannot bow to the coloniser whose, whose ancestors he spoke about in there are responsible for mass murder and mass genocide. Is it his responsibility or is it the Australia's responsibility to have a referendum and end his role as head of state? Well, we've seen the government walk back treaty. We've seen the government walk back truth. Now, if he wants to do anything to uh, allow peacemaking instruments here amongst First People and the coloniser, then he needs to show the way and he needs to instruct this parliament to treaty with First Peoples. As the Queensland election campaign gathers pace, the two major parties have again headed to the state's north. Their focus has been on health, with the LNP promising free vision, hearing and speech development checks for every child in kindergarten, the ALP remote dental services. Rocking out roadside in Townsville, David Crisofulli channeling Bon Jovi, perhaps praying for a smooth ride to the finish line. Both major party leaders were in the north, both campaigning on the theme of health. 
Labor promising a new Royal Flying Doctors Service dental truck for the Cape York region. This is going to be a game changer for bringing services closer to home. While the LNP leader was reshaping his plans for early childhood checks. How's that? Oh, I think David's used a rolling pin before. Yes, <laughs> normally to make pasta, but this is just as good. He's made a $27.5 million promise to offer every child in kindergarten free vision, hearing and speech tests from 2025-26. What this program does is give kids the opportunity and give families the ability to get the kind of care they need early in a child's development. And give them the best chance of staying engaged in school. The LNP says follow-up checks would be offered to children in years one, three and five if any health or developmental needs are identified at kindergarten. It's absolutely necessary that we get those things sorted early and any problems addressed. But Labor's accusing the LNP of imitating its ideas. This is another example of David Christofulli not having one new idea and simply handing in Labor's homework. Labor says vision checks are already universal for PrEP students. Children also have access to speech pathologists and hearing checks are targeted at those from vulnerable families. The LNP wants to go further. Every kid. At a pre-polling centre in Cairns, Bree James addressed the media after the LNP candidate's recent faux pas, where she referred to a vandalised poster resembling a Hitler moustache. My sign was defaced. I put up a joke about it. It was really poor taste and I'm really sorry about it. And I really hope everyone will forgive me for it. Tomorrow, both leaders will remain in the regions before heading back to Brisbane for one final debate. Jack Mackay, ABC News, Townsville. Let's return to Moldova now, where a referendum on whether to change its constitution and commit to joining the EU hangs in the balance. Joining me now is Associate Expert at Eastern Europe Studies Centre, Denis Chanusha. Denis, really good to have you on the programme. Now, there's roughly 1% of the ballots left to count, but it looks like that yes vote might be across the line. Now, why was this result so close, given that the, uh, the polls earlier had predicted 60% would vote in favour of yes? Yes, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, all the surveys were showing that the vote uh, camp will win, and that was somehow a very big um, miss for for the for the promotion of the of the referendum. I think that the two factors that that uh, led to that were the boycotting, which was uh, taking place by certain political parties, uh, as well as the no vote that was promoted primarily by the uh, the shore group, which is linked to, to Russia and is part of uh, Russian FIMI operations uh, in Moldova. Yeah, and how do you explain the sharp division in the yes and no vote? What does it tell us about the Moldovan electorate? Well, we, we have been um, aware of the fact that Moldova is a polarized country in terms of uh, geopolitical uh, preferences of the population. I believe that that was one of the reasons why the EU integration has been used by certain political forces, while the others, like Shore, uh, like Shore Group, uh, was promoting the integration with the Eurasian Union and with Russia. So this kind of difference, different uh, perspectives of the population, is present in the society and is very much driven by the social economic issues, like poverty, uh, opportunities, uh, emigration because of lack of opportunities in the country. Historically, historically though, why would uh, you know, many of Moldovans then uh, support the pro-Russian stance uh, in this referendum? Well, historically, we have regions in the country like Gagauza Autonomy or uh, Russian-speaking um, minorities that, uh, that live in the north of the country as well. We, we have a breakaway uh, uh, region, a Transnistrian separatist region that is also pro-Russian. So there are different ways through which uh, Russian voices are heard, but they usually become visible during the elections. So this is the moment when we see really how the population think. And unfortunately, the fact that many people are leaving the country and they live for, for, uh, for uh, residing in, in the EU, we see that these pro-EU votes in the country, they are diminishing, while those that are pro-Russian, they obviously stay in place because the population is aging, as well as becoming more conservative and, and, and tends to, uh, to prefer the, uh, the points of view that Russia is spreading uh, in the region. Now, the pro-EU incumbent, uh, Maya Sandu, 
she's accusing Russia of interference, as I mentioned earlier. Now, there are serious claims about Russia paying people to vote in a certain way. How credible are these reports? Well, we have the reports that were presented the three days before the elections by the uh, intelligence service as well, the national uh, police uh, institutions. So they they were showing evidence of different networks up to 130,000 uh, people were involved in them. But what was presented uh, yesterday or the, today by, uh, by the official sources is about 300,000 uh, people that were somehow paid or bribed to, to vote in a certain way, which is a much bigger number. So we have questions about how the state institutions are working to prevent this from happening. So if we know about these numbers, then why they uh, these networks still are operating and are able to actually influence the behavior of the voters? We don't have these answers yet, but I believe that uh, this, uh, this moment is important, one, in order to, to uh, draw lessons from what has been done uh, in the wrong way. So if Russia is wanting to interfere, uh, why is it such, such a strategic significance? Why is Moldova such of uh, significance to Russia, given they don't share a border and it's, uh, you know, uh, by population, a very small country? Well, you're, you're rightly pointing out that this is not a big, uh, of a big importance uh, country for, for Russia. But we have to look at this uh, through the uh, geopolitical context, right? But Moldova has been very important for Ukraine. It's about stability and it's about the geopolitical uh, uh, stand uh, that, uh, that has the uh, official uh, part of Moldova. So for, for Russia, it's important to change the political dynamics in Moldova and to switch the, the tension from this pro-EU vector into something that Russia would prefer, which is a balanced foreign policy that is common to what Hungary, Serbia, or Georgia is doing at the moment. So I believe that the interest is more about, about geopolitical wins, and it's about Ukraine and its, its stability at the, uh, at the Western uh, borders. Uh, Dennis, uh, how do you think this is being viewed on the other end of the spectrum by Brussels or the European Commission? Well, uh, if to be honest, uh, Brussels is uh, in a little shock because uh, the service were showing uh, a comfortable win, which somehow probably uh, has to, to be uh, also revised in order to make sure that, uh, that Brussels and the EU institutions are informing themselves from different sources not only from surveys that tend to, uh, to favor Maya Sandu and her political party. What is also clear is that the, uh, the attention that has been given to Moldova by, by the EU, by NATO, but by member states of these two organizations was sufficient enough, but was not, not very efficient in terms of uh, preventing uh, Russia from influencing these elections. So probably these techniques that Russia has used will be obviously uh, replicated in other places. So it's, it's, it's the right moment for, for the EU and NATO to learn from, from this miss in, uh, in the elections uh, that, take, that took place in Moldova. Now, the incumbent Maya Sandu, she won the first round with 40 percent of the vote. How do you think the second round is shaping up with the main rival, Alexander uh, Stoyanoglu, with the pro-Russian party of socialists? Well, it will be a very tough, uh, a very tough uh, round for for Maya Sandu because she didn't take part in uh, in debates. She refused to take part in debates uh, during the first round while Stoyanoglu was training himself. So he's not a uh, he's not a Romanian speaking uh, person. His uh, native language is Russian, but he was really doing a lot uh, of uh, of this training uh, in different places in uh, across the country. So I believe that uh, he has been preparing himself for, for the second round. I'm not sure about Maya Sandu that she is really ready, but hopefully her team uh, made everything possible to really learn from the narratives that Stoyanoglu is using. And it's also true to, to mention that Stoyanoglu has been somehow softening his uh, pro-EU views. And he was more and more speaking about having a strategic dialogue with Russia. So he was really taking over certain narratives of, of the Socialist Party that is backing him. He is not the member of this party, but he needed this party in order to, to compete against uh, Maya Sandu. Now they are going to be in, uh, in the runoff head-to-head. Uh, -head. So if Stoyanoglu does win, do you expect him to respect the results of the referendum and push ahead with EU membership? 
Well, this uh, result should be validated by uh, by the constitutional court and and the by, by the parliament. So it should become part of the constitution. These results will be obviously respected. What will not be probably respected in terms of political games and political disputes is, is the interpretation of the results. We have to acknowledge that we have 49 percent of the population that voted, not 50 plus one, but 49. Out of 49, we have 50 plus a margin win in favor of the of the yes camp. So it will be a lot of uh, disinformation, probably propaganda that will be used, including by Russia, in order to undermine the credibility of this result. So I believe that this will be actually the most important aspect of this, uh, of this referendum, that it will not be trusted by the population, and, and it will be also uh, a, a very big, uh, a very big miss for my son in the second round as well. The parliamentary elections next year. And given what you just said about the uh, the, uh, the voter turnout, is the boycotts and the propaganda the only reason why half the voting public didn't vote? Well, I like that you are really pointing to the to the problems that are not discussed that much uh, outside of this country. We have also pro-EU voters that are against my Sandu. So we have a protest vote that has been also used during this uh, during uh, these elections, and it should not be discounted because we we see that there are alternative pro-EU political parties that have been overlooked over uh, during this four four years of uh, my Sandu's uh, presidency. Okay, uh, Dennis Chanusha, really good to get your analysis on this. Thanks very much. Thank you for the invitation. Hong Kong authorities have said a soil infection is responsible for a batch of monkey deaths at the city zoo. A bacterial infection called meliodosis killed at least nine monkeys and is suspected to have caused two more deaths over the weekend. An autopsy revealed the bacteria likely came from soil near their enclosure. Officials say it's unlikely that the animals would pass the infections on to humans. Under normal circumstances, melodosis infection is through contact with contaminated soil and surface waters, but not person to person or animal to person. The park has so digging work in early October. Together with the following possibilities, the monkeys might have contact with the bacteria. Spain's Coast Guard says it performed one of its largest migrant rescues off the coast of the Canary Islands. The Coast Guard found more than 230 migrants on one wooden boat. That's the highest number of people to be found on a single boat off the island of Gran Canaria so far this year. The boat was towed to shore where the migrants were able to disembark. Spanish government data shows boat travel along this route has risen by almost 40 percent compared to this time next year. Drivers in Australia's three biggest cities are painfully aware of the cost of using toll roads. Now, a leading industry figure is calling for a shake-up of how those charges are set. Former Trans-Urban Director Tony Shepard has told Four Corners toll companies should not get automatic price increases above inflation on new roads. Edwina Hyler used to travel to work on Sydney's toll roads, but when the amount she was paying each week hit $150 in December last year, she quit her job and found a new one closer to home and away from the tolls. It just wasn't, you know, feasible anymore to pay that kind of money in tolls just to get to work. Like, I'd have to work a, a day just to pay tolls. It's a feeling familiar to drivers in Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne, where toll prices have surged during the cost of living crisis. That's because they're pegged to inflation. And so Transurban earned a record $3.5 billion in revenue last financial year, operating 18 of Australia's 22 toll roads. Their business is not there for the public good, it's there to make money. Even in times of low inflation, most of its tolls are guaranteed to rise by 4% a year. A giant of the industry and former Transurban director Tony Shepard says that deal should be off the table for future toll roads. Well, I think in new projects, I think we can eliminate it. Now, we put it in originally because the risks were just so enormous and that was what we needed to get people to be prepared to invest. Transurban declined an interview and did not respond to questions, but in a statement said... Toll prices in Australia and how much they rise have always been determined by state or local governments, as have the charges associated with toll notices and late payments. The New South Wales government has promised to slash toll prices in Sydney and is now negotiating a new tolling model with Transurban. 
if we don't reform tolls, uh, Sydney will become a more congested place to live. It'll be less productive than it should be. It'll have a real impact on people's lives, particularly in Sydney's outer suburbs. Since Edwina Hyler changed jobs, the state government's introduced a two-year $60 per week cap on tolls. But when it ends, drivers like her may be back to paying full price. Pat McGrath, ABC News. As families feel the cost of living pinch, generous West Australians are converting their front yards and garages into food pantries. Organisers of Perth charity Feed It Forward say their services are more in demand than ever. In the foothills of Perth, Athena Powell's makeshift food pantry is open for business. She opens her Forestfield garage to people in need five days a week and shoppers don't have to pay a thing. It's grown tremendously with so many volunteers, so many more people needing the help. A tough upbringing inspired Athena to start helping others in her community. I was with my sister, so I helped raise her from the age of 10. She's five years younger than me. We had nothing. We had no food. We were lucky to have a roof over our house. All the fresh produce is collected from supermarkets and producers and distributed to more than 500 volunteers by grassroots charity Feed It Forward, which was founded by Perth grandmother Monica Moringa in 2018. We're currently saving about 70,000 kilos of food every week. We're feeding more than 10,000 directly with the help of up to 700 community groups who are also feeding community. For single mum of three, Cam, the food pantry in her local suburb has been a lifeline. With retraining and not being able to work or wanting to get a better life, you've got to do it tough a little bit. So, yeah, with the cost of living and um, the rental crisis and stuff, something you, there's not much left over for the at the end of the fortnight. So, you know, um, this has definitely been a godsend for me and my boys. The charity now has more than 100 local food pantries across the state, an increasingly important lifeline as costs continue to rise. Kate Lever, ABC News. In sport, Charles Leclerc has won the US Formula One Grand Prix ahead of his Ferrari teammate Carlos Sainz. It was the third victory of the year for the 27-year-old from Monaco. Lando Norris had finished third but received a five-second penalty for passing Max Verstappen off the track. Verstappen was elevated to third position ahead of Norris and extended his championship lead over the Englishman to 57 points. Australian Oscar Piastri finished fifth. It's just how it is. It's quite clear in the ruling. You can't overtake outside the white line. Um, yeah, there's not more to say. I mean, uh, it's, it's painful. But uh, up until then, of course, we had a really good battle. New Zealand is celebrating its first women's T20 World Cup triumph after defeating South Africa by 32 runs in the final in Dubai. Player of the tournament, Amelia Kerr, top scored with 43 as the White Ferns made five for 158. Kerr also took three wickets as South Africa was restricted to nine for 126. It was a remarkable turnaround for New Zealand. It came into the tournament on a 10-game losing streak. Well, it feels like the season's only just begun, but with AFLW finals around the corner, there's been mixed reactions to the league's trial of condensed fixturing. After squeezing 11 games into a 10-week home and away season, the players say something needs to change. After a whirlwind eight weeks, the AFLW finals picture is becoming clearer. Not wanting to look too far ahead, but um, also knowing, you know, we, we do need to keep winning. Having won four in a row, Melbourne is one of the teams on the cusp of the top eight. The Demons will need to overcome an equally strong Hawthorne, which remains in contention for the minor premiership. We've had a lot of success and a lot of change this year as well, and I think that it's about maintaining our form, um, not looking too far ahead, just taking it week by week. Thursday's battle between the two sides will be the opening game of the competition's Indigenous round, capping off a controversial condensed home and away season with the 18 teams each playing 11 games across 10 weeks. I think that there's general consensus that the condensed fixture is, is probably not uh, something that we'd like to continue with. It just puts a lot of strain on, on the players and on the clubs themselves. The league has a guaranteed minimum of 12 matches per team next season and is looking at bringing the season forward to an earlier start to alleviate the fixture crunch. I know 
hopefully we've learned from, from this year from a time slot point of view from broadcasting we can take those learnings forward but um, supportive of playing as much football as possible. It's obviously been a bit of a tough period, the condensed fixture with concussion and injury. We've obviously seen key players go out um, and find it hard to get up. So, But I think the overarching philosophy is we want to be playing more footy. There'll be more footy in more places this weekend with Darwin and Cairns hosting matches on the first week of the Indigenous round. Fraser Fife, ABC News, Melbourne. Let's have a look at tomorrow's weather around the country. Mostly fine in Perth and Adelaide, wet in Hobart. Some clouds lingering over Melbourne and Canberra, slightly overcast in Sydney and Brisbane. Mostly fine in Townsville and Cairns, a few showers for Darwin, some clouds about for Broome, hot and clear in Alice Springs with a, with a top there of 38 degrees. Let's recap our top stories before we go. Provisional results suggest Moldova has voted by the slimmest of margins to join the EU amid warnings of Russian interference. Israel continues strikes in Lebanon targeting Hezbollah's financial infrastructure. And independent Senator Lydia Thorpe escorted out of a royal reception at Parliament House after shouting at King Charles. And that is your world for tonight. You can always watch the show on iView and more world news and interviews can be found at the ABC's YouTube channel. I'm Girish Saulani. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.